Obsession by Calvin Klein. Yeah. That's from my album on Polygram Records, I'm Your Woman. Thank you for buying it. Don't be afraid, it's still out there. Can I ask you a question? Anne Klein, too. I really feel bad for John Denver. <laughs> you know, he went to uh, Washington with Frank Zappa to do the uh, hearings on obscenities and rock lyrics and uh, music, popular music. He was defending the right to write whatever you want. And I'll tell you something, when uh, 
Rocky Mountain High came out, I remember the controversy that went on about that song. The violent images. It was a nightmare. You know, he wanted to, uh, to do that um, We Are the World. He wanted to be on that album, and they wouldn't let him. He offered to pay to be on that album, and they wouldn't let him sing. And it pissed me off. I was very angry. It's a free charity that people are getting a lot of publicity for. You know, I mean, Joni Mitchell, Ethiopia, Ethiopia. I mean, the bitch is sitting out in Malibu Colony chain smoking. What the fuck does she know about Ethiopia? <laughs> but they haven't asked me to do one of these benefits yet. But you can bet I'll do it. Free publicity, great exposure. Murray, sign me up, I'll be there. Love it. Love to exploit people's misfortunes to further my own career. Hey, <laughs> it's a good thing to do. Keep smiling, keep shining, knowing you can always count on me. That's for sure. <laughs> That's what friends are for. Let me tell you something. Dionne Warwick and I have been friends, and damn good friends, for nine and a half years. I called her about two weeks ago. I had a bad cold. I said, Dion, honey, maybe could you stop like at Arts and pick me up a quart of chicken soup with some noodles? She said, honey, no, I can't get near you. have a cold, and I, I don't want to catch it because I'm singing, and I just... And you want her to be there? You expect her to be there for you? If you have AIDS, I wouldn't count on it, truly, really. Okay, pretend it's 1978, and you're straight. <laughs> a friend calls you up one night, says, hey man, uh, maybe you want to go out tonight, want to go out and do a little dancing or something, I haven't seen you for a while, and you say, yeah, you know, I just broke up with that Playboy bunny, and uh, might be kind of fun. So he comes by and a little while later, pulls up in his Firebird, you come out and check it out. Hey, nice new Firebird, man, it's cool. Want to come in for a couple of brews? Yeah, sure, why not? You guys sit around bullshit for a while, talk about old times, girls used to date in high school and everything. And you run upstairs and get dressed, put on a pair of khakis and, you know, button down white shirts and top siders. You get in the car and you drive around and drive down some kind of unfamiliar streets and one in particular, you stop and uh, it kind of looks like a warehouse. You get out and hear some kind of pulsating music coming from within. Hey, this could be kind of cool. Yeah, sure, man, this is cool. It's, got, it's going in. You, know, you go up some stairs, you walk in. The place is real dark, kind of smoky, and you don't see too many people. They're all kind of hidden in the shadows. And matter of fact, you don't see any girls at all, you know. Oh, wait a minute, maybe you do. Got some Pendletons on and some, uh, some jeans and... Big fat asses, I don't know, not the kind of girls you like, goddammit. There's something, something's wrong here. You feel a little nervous, you know, breaking out kind of a cold sweat, your stomach's getting a little cramped, and uh, you're starting to see maybe something a little weird here. Uh, maybe some guys are dancing together, what is this shit? You know, getting a little nervous, <laughs> order a beer. Okay, some guy comes up to you wearing a, like a real tight pair of five-button Levi's and has a red bandana hanging out of his left pocket and a tank top t-shirt and handlebar mustache. Hey man, want a beer? No thanks, I just ordered one. Takes out a bottle of popper, shoves him up underneath your nose. You breathe in, because what else can you do? It's there, shit, you know, you breathe it in. And you know, you're starting to feel kind of good, but God damn it, you're straight, man. You're straight, it's okay, relax, you're cool, you know, you don't really know what's going on. But kind of go out to the dance floor, and then in the corner of the disco, you see this big, big black man in a big gold caftan, kind of looming above you. He's got red lipstick smeared across his face and a short blonde afro. And he's rising above you in the smoke. Somebody hands you a tambourine.
Disco, we miss it. <laughs> oh, Laura, do we miss it? Ah, oh, but I feel real. Mm-hmm. Might if I just have a sip of a delicious and refreshing beverage, as I've been known to do on many occasions. Also, I've been known to fly first class on many occasions. And do I like to eat? Let's check out the menu and see what they have to offer. A cucumber basket with small golf shrimp served with a zesty cocktail sauce and garnishes. <laughs> what they failed to tell me was included was a chunk of delicious fresh Norwegian salmon. Thank you. A salad, hearts of lettuce, always good along with your personal salad bar of garden vegetables. God, it took me five minutes to get through the bar. It was incredible. Every kind of fresh vegetable right there at my seat. For your entree, I had my choice of Chateau Briand, lovingly carved at the table. Cornish hen. No, I went with salmon quenelles, a fluffy salmon mousse served with a rich lobster sauce. Good thing to eat on an Eastern Airline cross-country country flight. Do they ever stop feeding you on first class? No, they don't ever leave you alone. God damn it, I flew first class so I could just relax. Now please get the fuck out of my face, okay? Because if I have to go back and coach, I'll fly coach so I can eat a quick little meal and go to sleep. Airport, airport. Airport. As we drove along, a trail of smoke poured out of the tail of the 747 that was flying overhead. Oh, the humanity! The humanity! All right, you're on the way to the airport to pick up your best friend in the entire world. And you get gripped with an incredibly intense fear that their plane has crashed. And you know when you get there, 
that if his plane has crashed, you have a lot of things to take care of that day. <laughs> so you're driving, and you get there, and you get there, and you're driving, and you park in the no parking zone, and you get out, and you slam your door, and you walk in, you walk up to the counter. Has Flight 45 crashed by any chance? <laughs> and at this point, you're too freaked out to even look up at the screen because you know you're going to see Flight 45 crashed. <laughs> and you've got a lot of things to take care of right now. You have to order up deli platters, cater meals for the relatives. Go ahead, get some rare roast beef on the plate. Throw in a loaf of challah, some rye bread. Some corned beef, some pepper beef. At a time like this, maybe corned beef isn't exciting enough. Pepper beef adds a little excitement. Of course they're in shock, of course they're in mourning, but they want to forget the problem. Get some good breast meat, white breast meat of turkey on there. Throw in some dills, get some coleslaw. You think you can't afford some potato salad? Throw on some potato salad. Get some sweets, some rugelach. some mandel bread, a sponge cake. Don't scrimp, at a time like this, there's no time to scrimp. Make a pot of coffee. Anybody want some tea? And suddenly somebody grabs you and slaps you in your face. It's your best friend because you're an hour late. You were so caught up in your hideous, morbid fantasy that you completely forgot what time his plane came in. When a plane goes down in a lonely town, who knows, who knows? When a plane goes down in a who cries, who cries Well, the tumbles down from the blue, blue sky And all the people start to cry Oh, my God, they're gonna down In a small, small town, in a small, small town When a plane goes down in a small, small town Who knows? Who knows when a plane goes down in a small, small town, it glows, it glows. And the flames shoot up and the smoke pours out and all the people start to shout when a plane goes down, when a plane goes down in a small, small town, in a small, small town. It goes down, die, they'll die, it goes down, plane down, they die, they cry, plane down, in a small, small town, plane down, down, down. Maybe I like a, a large towel or perhaps even a paper towel. I won't open my own. I just need to, I need to blot. I'm a little bit like hot and sweaty. That's okay, never mind. <laughs> Certainly somebody could have offered their hanky. You have one, don't you? Why are you wearing sunglasses? So sweet. You'll get it back. I love you. Mmm, it smells very good. What are you wearing? A lot of different things. I do the same thing. Tonight I'm wearing Kalesh by, by Hermes. I'm wearing some sandalwood oil and some vanilla oil. And two different kinds of deodorant. <laughs> and sandalwood powder. And my lotion has sandalwood oil in it. Enough for you? Apparently not. This is great. This is a little thing for your hair. Well, it's mine now, and I love it. <laughs> yes, well, you know, I, I kind of like to think of myself as one of them. I don't think she really wants it back. I kind of like to think of myself as one of those people who, like, discovered Bruce Springsteen. You know how you like, everybody has their certain star they, they, they want to think they discovered, like, you know, back in, about 13 years ago before I moved here in Arizona, I used to listen to him every night when I'd go to sleep, and God, I'd go see all the shows, and then I moved here, and nobody knew who, who he was at first, and then he got really popular, and 
Well, then I went to see him, uh, when was the last time, in um, New Jersey. And um, I was at a party a couple months ago, and this guy came over to me and said, uh, didn't I see you at the Springsteen concert in New Jersey? I said, yeah, but I'm, you know, it's amazing you remember me. This is incredible. He goes, are you going to the show here? I said, no, I didn't get any tickets. And he said, well, let me get you a few. I said, okay. He was the bass player for Bruce, and I thought it was kind of cool. So I went out there with some friends, and um, it was a great show. Bruce was, you know, you really couldn't see him. He had the video screen. You got the idea, you know. <laughs> Bruce was like doing about six of his songs. I was into it. It was kind of a relaxed evening. And then he just started talking, you know, how he likes to talk. And he's talking about some people who've influenced him and who've really meant a lot to him. And he started talking about this girl. He said, yeah, man, I heard this girl. Sandra Bernhard girl. And she really blew me away. I got her album, you know. And I was laying in bed the other night with my wife, Julianne, and I was kind of distant and thinking about some other things. And she said, honey, you OK? And I said, yeah, I'm just thinking about this Sandra Bernhard Jack. I mean, it's not even sexual or nothing like that. I mean, she's kind of like, She's kind of like everything that America is to me. You know, when I think of her, I think of like the, the steel workers or the guys coming out of the coal mines with their face all covered with soot and the shit in their lungs. When I think of her, I think of the poor unemployed black guy on the street. I think of the amber waves of grain and the great northern lights performing in the summer. She's like a prison wall, man. She breaks out. She breaks through. And I just can't get her off of my mind. And I know she's here tonight. And I know it's a lot to ask. But I'd like her to come down and do a song with me. And I'm looking around at my friends. I'm getting a little nervous. I said, well, go ahead, go ahead. And I said, I can't believe this is so insane. He goes, you know, I know it's a lot to ask. And I started walking down through the crowd. And there was like a beam of light coming right at me, like the Nantucket lighthouse just bringing me in and 80,000 people are screaming Sandra Sandra and I said shit I knew I had a lot of fans but this is like overwhelming and I walk right up to the stage and Bruce puts down his big American arm and just lifts me up in one fell swoop and the big man gives me five how you doing big man looking good tonight Bruce is just standing there looking out. He says, I can't look at you. I'm too nervous. I'm a little scared. But I'd love you to do this song, and I know you know it. It would mean a lot to me and my wife. And to everybody here. We're videotaping it for HBO.
It's only an executive from Paramount. It's okay. <laughs> Good night. Glad you're here. <laughs> Executives get so shy when they're not at their studio. Oh, you're coming back. Okay, I feel better. I was feeling very self-conscious, like maybe you didn't like my script or something. Have you read it? Well, you weren't supposed to, you asshole. Who gave it to you? They also have no sense of humor. Oh. Most importantly. God, Hollywood is so great when you don't live there. But there's no way out, baby, when you're in the business. You take me, for instance. I've chose, I've taken the path, I've chosen to turn down all movie roles that have been offered to me. I've chosen not to do any more movies. I don't know if I told you. <laughs> Except for the occasional, occasional cameo. A Sesame Street movie? Two days work in Toronto, scale? Count me in. Otherwise, I'm not interested. Leading roles, anything opposite, opposite Deborah Winger or anybody? No. <laughs> Love scenes, Whoopi Goldberg? I have to think about it. <laughs> Shh, we have a moment of silence. For Whoopi Goldberg. No. Hollywood is like, you know, a great place, and I, I like the way they, it's kind of like white trash is just completely taken over, and, and I like, like S Sam Shepard. I mean, what does this guy think, like a bunch of broken, funky, dirty teeth is sexy? Him and Harry Dean Stanton. I don't know. I don't know if that's sexy. Maybe it is to some women. Apparently, Jessica thinks it is. But more than anything, I want to see somebody kick Sylvester Stallone's ass. <laughs> and I think Chuck Norris is the man for the job, personally. <laughs> so many heroes, so many heroes. Which one to choose? Which way to go? I don't know. I frankly can't get enough of those heroes. Actually, I'm coming out in another film soon. Um, a film I'm very excited about, Casually Seeking Sandra. <laughs> it's about this really geeky girl who gets a crush on me, we hang out, and then like, I, I dump her because I'm bored with her and shit. And it's like <laughs> now, actually, I was offered to do a role on St. Elsewhere to play a clown with multiple sclerosis. and. Um, <laughs> I just didn't think I had the emotional range to pull it off, so I turned it down. And then I did a Hitchcock, um, just a small role in a very small episode. You know, one of those tiny episodes that lasts about 13 minutes. So I went to do the voiceovers one day, because you guys you have to do looping, because they don't catch your voice. Excuse me, I've just burped. Forgive me. Um, and anyways, the guy that was running the looping session was like, you know, he was white trash, only he was like apocalyptic white trash. <laughs> and somebody asked him what they thought of the fires around LA, because you know, every year there's all these fires, and so he started going on this like rampage, quoting like, you know, the Book of Revelations and stuff. Well, it says right there in the Book of Revelations, there will be fires. At the end of the world, yes, this is indeed a sign. There will be locusts all over the land and in the Midwest on the farms. There are 600 locusts per square inch. The farmers have counted it, as opposed to 20, which is the normal amount. One of the signs, the world is coming to an end. There will be a great plague, AIDS. I'll say no more. Do not want to appear to be judgmental. We have a president in the White House. His name equals 666, the sign of the devil. It's all there. It's in the book of Revelations, right here in L.A., there was a warehouse found with 20,000 fetuses, 20,000 souls that were not permitted to enter this world. 
a sin, the end of the world, I said, would you please stop it? You're really bringing me down. <laughs> Thank you people for uh, helping me put my uh, new show together, my work in progress, John Boscovich, is working the soundboard. Was the sound good, John? And uh, Mitch Kaplan, my piano player. Yes, and there's many other people I'll thank during my encore. Thank you. 
And God. I guess I should have known by you where you parked your car sideways that it wouldn't last. Cause you're the kind of person who believes in making our ones love them and leave them fast. I guess I must be dumb, yet a pocket full of horses, Trojans and some of them you. But it was Saturday night, I guess that makes it all right. You said, what have I got to lose? And honey, I said, little red coffee. Baby, you're much too bad. I should have closed my eyes when you took me to the place where your horses run free. Cause I felt a little ill when you showed me the pictures of the jockeys that were there before me. Believe it or not, I started to worry, wondering if I had enough class. But it was Saturday night, I guess I made to be in jail. It's on the verge of being obscene. 